Hello friends, welcome to tutorial in English literature. In today's lesson, I shall talk about 18th century prose writer Jonathan Swift, who is regarded as one of the foremost prose satirists in English language. My main focus will be on the socio-political context of England and Ireland that shaped his creative mind and influenced his writing. This lesson will introduce you with all the necessary background information that you must know to understand Jonathan Swift's writing. Before I proceed further, I want to ask a question. The question is, which type of satire does poke fun at human foibles? Your options are Juvenilian satire, Horatian satire, Manipian satire. I will tell you the answer at the end of the lesson. Let's begin our discussion without further delay. Jonathan Swift was born in 1667 in Dublin, in the Kingdom of Ireland. At that time, Ireland was a colony of England. His father was a Protestant Anglo-Irish man. He accompanied his brothers to Ireland to seek their fortunes. In England, their family estate was brought to ruin during the English Civil War, as their father was a royalist, that is, a supporter of King Charles I. Swift's father died in Dublin about seven months before his son was born. His mother returned to England after his birth, leaving him in the care of his uncle, Godwin Swift. He sent Swift to Clickney College, which was at the time the best school in Ireland. There, he received the foundations of the classical humanist education reserved for boys of his social class. In 1682, Swift entered Trinity College in Dublin. It was then Ireland's only university. There he continued his studies in Latin and Greek, adding Hebrew and deepening his knowledge of Aristotelian philosophy. After four years, he graduated with the degree of BA. Swift was studying for his master's degree when political troubles broke out in England. After Charles II's death in 1695, his Roman Catholic brother, James II, became King of England, Scotland and Ireland. At that time, the relations between the Catholics and Protestants were tense. There was also conflict between the British Parliament and the monarchy. James supported the freedom of the worship for Catholics and appointed Catholic officers to the army. He also dissolved his parliament and attempted to create a new parliament that would support him unconditionally. When King James II married a Roman Catholic as his second wife and decided to raise his son as a Catholic, many feared a Catholic dynasty in England was imminent. The English parliament invited his Protestant daughter Mary and her Dutch husband William, Prince of Orange, to rule. King James II flee England under military threat. It gave Parliament more power over the monarchy. This is known as the Glorious Revolution. In Ireland, Trinity College was closed due to this political turmoil. Swift left for England in 1688 along with many other anxious Protestants. They feared retaliations from displaced and disadvantaged Catholics of Ireland as Ireland was a Catholic country. In England, his mother helped him to get a position as secretary and personal assistant of notable English diplomat and a Whig politician Sir William Temple at Moor Park in Surrey. There Swift met Esther Johnson. Swift was her tutor and mentor, giving her the nickname Stella and the two maintained a close relationship for the rest of Esther's life. Swift received his MA from Hart Hall, Oxford in 1692. In 1694, he left Moor Park and returned to Ireland in order to become an ordained priest in the established Church of Ireland, which was the Irish branch of the Anglican Church. He spent a year as a country person far away from Dublin. Swift felt miserable and isolated in a small remote community far from the centers of power and influence. There he was surrounded by a strong Presbyterian community. 
Swift disliked both Roman Catholicism and Presbyterianism. So Swift left Ireland and returned to act as secretary to Sir Temple in England in 1696 and he remained there until Temple's death. During this time, Swift wrote The Battle of the Books. The book was a playfully serious mock heroic account of a conflict between the books in St. James Library. It ends with the victory of ancients. Sir William Temple died in 1699. Swift failed so miserably to get a new position that he accepted the lesser post of secretary and chaplain to the Earl of Berkeley, one of the Lord's Justice of Ireland. As chaplain to Lord Berkeley, he spent much of his time in Dublin and travelled to London frequently over the next 10 years. At that time, Swift engaged with the political disputes of Whig and Tory. Whig and Tory are members of two opposing political parties in England, particularly during the 18th century. If you want to know more about Whig and Tory, you can watch my video about Whig and Tory that you will find in the i button and in the description of this video. Swift considered himself a Whig in politics that is supporter of the parliament and a Tory in religion that is a supporter of the established Anglican church over all religion descent. At the same time, Swift was against the Tory's support for the hereditary rights of James II despite his Roman Catholic faith. He was a supporter of glorious revolution. He was a believer in the new balance of power between the king, lords and commons, which was brought in by the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688. He was afraid of the intense religious conflict in 17th century England. In his thoughts on religion, Swift wrote that every man as a member of the commonwealth ought to be content with the possession of his own opinion in private. During his visits to England in these years, Swift published A Tale of a Tub, The Battle of the Books and Bickerstaff Papers, which he wrote under the pseudonym Isaac Bickerstaff, and began to gain a reputation as a writer. This led to close lifelong friendships with Alexander Pope, the playwright John Gay, Queen's Anne's physician John Arbuthnot and Robert Harley. They were the core members of the Martinus Cribleras Club, founded in 1713. A Tale of a Tub was a defense of Anglican doctrine and an attack on free thinking. The core of A Tale of a Tub is the allegorical history of the church related through the story of three brothers, Peter, whose name came from Saint Peter and who stands for Roman Catholicism, Jack, who was named after John Kelvin and who stands for the various dissenting Protestant churches such as the Baptists, Presbyterians, Quakers, Congregationalists and Anabaptists. And the last brother, Martin, whose name was derived from Martin Luther, symbolizes Anglicanism. The brothers have inherited three wonderfully satisfactory quotes by their father and they have his will to guide them. Here the father stands for God, his will represents Bible and the courts represents religious practice. Although the will says that the brothers are forbidden from making any changes to their courts, that is the religious practice, they do nearly nothing but alter their courts from the start. Though the debate is apparently resolved in favor of Martin. It was received by some readers as an attack on Christianity itself. Queen Anne thought this book was blasphemous and denied Swift the promotion he coveted on the grounds that the author of a tale of a tub was too dangerous to be made a bishop. Swift was sent to London to pursue the Whig government to abandon the first fruits and 20th parts two taxes that the poor Anglican clergy found hard to pay. Before Reformation, it had been sent to Rome. First fruits were the first year's income of a newly appointed cleric and then a tenth of the income in subsequent years. When the Whigs refused this financial aid, Swift turned against them, 
even though he was a whig by birth education and political principles swift had considered them as his friends and helped them while he worked for sir william temple at the same time he was also passionately loyal to anglican church and began dislike whig's growing support for nonconformists when tory came to power in 1710 the new first minister robert harley granted the church of ireland the tax concession they had demanded swift fully repaid harley's confidence and quickly became their chief pamphleteer and political writer he edited the tory newspaper the examiner and wrote the highly influential pamphlet the conduct of the allies in this pamphlet he attacked the whig government for its inability to end the prolonged war with france the incoming tory government conducted secret and at the same time illegal negotiations with france resulting in the treaty of utrecht ending the war of the spanish succession this pamphlet helped to turn public opinion against british participation in the long lasting war of the spanish succession swift was part of the inner circle of the tory government swift recorded his experiences and thoughts during this difficult time in a long series of letters to esther johnson collected and published after his death as a journal to stella when queen anne died and george the first became king the whigs returned to power and the tory leaders were put on trial for treason for conducting secret negotiations with france with the fall of tories swift so for a church appointment in england also came to an end the best position his friends could secure for him was the deanery of st patrick's in dublin he returned to ireland to die as he says like a poisoned rat in a hole once in ireland however swift became a staunch supporter of ireland and began to publish a series of powerful tracts in support of irish causes attacking the english attempts to weaken their economy and political power and criticizing the policies of prime minister robert walpole i have already mentioned that ireland was a british colony since 12th century the british empire began developing its colonization tactics in ireland and then exported them throughout the world since the late 15th century the irish parliament's freedom to make new law had been reduced by the british parliament the resentment of irish people especially over trade restrictions intensified after the british legislature passed the declaratory act of 1720 this act insisted that the kingdom of ireland was dependent on the parliament of great britain in response to this act swift wrote an anonymous pamphlet entitled a proposal for the universal use of irish manufacture urging irish men and women to use home produced goods and reject imports from england a more serious challenge to britain's right to interfere in irish economic affairs arose in 1722 then an english iron master william wood was granted a patent to produce around 1 lakh of copper currency for ireland jonathan swift wrote the first of his celebrated drapier's letters under the pseudonym mb drapier these pamphlets encouraged all irish men and women to reject wood's hapens on moral political and economic grounds the drapier's letters inflamed all ireland caused the cancellation of the coin scheme swift was then hailed as a national hero of ireland though he himself was a member of ireland colonial ruling class then he turned his energies to completing the book he had been writing for the past several years travels into several remote nations of the world universally known as gulliver's travels his most well known a modest proposal is a bitter satire that retain the power to shock even today the full title of swift's pamphlet is a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or the country and for making them beneficial to the public his proposal is to fatten up these undernourished children and feed them to ireland's rich landowners he argues that 
it will check over population and unemployment reduce the poor family's expense of child bearing while providing them with a little extra income add a new variety to the food of the wealthy and contribute to the overall economic well-being of the nation the terrible distress of ireland also prompted swift to write the eloquent short view of the present state of ireland and with his friend and fellow clergyman thomas sheridan to produce a weekly paper the intelligencer swift also produced some of his finest poetry in the late 1720s and 1730s aside from the birthday poems to stella swift produced the so called scatological poems including a beautiful young nymph going to bed the lady's dressing table and strephon and chol which take delight in exposing the dirty and diseased bodies that lie beneath the fine surface of 18th century life finest of all is the profoundly ambiguous verses on the death of dr swift in this poem swift imagines the reaction of his friends enemies and readers following his demise in fact swift would have lived for a decade after writing that poem but in increasingly poor health swift had prepared an elaborate plan for alleviating the distress of those suffering from mental illness in his will he left money for the building of a hospital to be run on lines very different from the bedlams of london and dublin the hospital was st patrick's hospital dublin which opened in 1759 and continues to treat sufferers today jonathan swift died in 1745 at the age of 78 in the city where he was born he is buried in the st patrick's cathedral he had long written his own latin epitaph which is to be seen in the cathedral today almost two centuries later w b yeats rendered the epitaph in english verse here are the lines swift had sailed into his rest savage indignation there cannot lassicrate his breast imitate him if you dare world bestowed traveler he served human liberty now let's discuss briefly swift's writing style swift did not use ornate or rhetorical language he wrote in a very plain and downright style at times when swift was writing serious stuff this same plain style appears dry but when writing humorously this same plainness gives his wit a singular edge he also focuses on the satirical tone and harsh irony in his satire his satire has become famous as swiftian satire he also has written many memorable epigrammatic lines i have selected a few memorable lines here the first one is we have enough religion to make us hate but not enough to make us laugh one another the second one is satire is a mirror in which a man sees everyone's face but his own the next one is vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others the fourth is you should never be ashamed to admit you have been wrong it only proves you are wiser today than yesterday the fifth one is laws are like cobwebs which may catch small flies but let wasps and hornets break through the sixth one is every man desires to live long but no man wishes to be old the next one is there are few wild beasts more to be dreaded than a talking man having nothing to say the next one is brick stalkers are generally slow thinkers the last one is the best doctors in the world are dr diet dr quite and dr merriman now let's go back to the question the correct answer is horatian satire it is the most gentle and sympathetic towards its subject through light hearted humor horatian satirists address issues that they view more as follies rather than evil this kind of satire rarely includes personal attacks but rather aims to promote morals and teach lessons alexander pope's the rape of the lock is a fine example of horatian satire 
On the other hand, Juvenilian satyr is generally less kind towards its subject than Horatian. Juvenilian satirists do not just see their subjects' actions as wrong or silly, but as evil. Their style then contains less traditional humor and more sarcasm and strong irony. It is in this kind of satire that we can really see the writer's objections and their call for a change. George Orwell's Animal Farm and 1984 are examples of juvenilian satire. The last type of satire, Manipian, targets mental attitudes and viewpoints rather than specific individuals. Though not as harsh as juvenilian satire, Manipian satirists often target what they see as harmful attitudes or mindsets. That's all for today. Thank you for listening.